Thank you so much. And I am Jason Strickland, a workforce program manager on the Education to Workforce team at Amazon. And thank you for joining us for empowering entry-level talent to drive cloud modernization. Uh, today we're going to learn from an esteemed panel of representatives across three states, and we're going to talk about how they're addressing the cloud talent demand, uh, connecting industry, academia, and government, um, and with help from AWS education programs. So on our panel, we have Neil DeMondo from the Chief of Staff of the Connecticut Office of Workforce um, Strategy. We have Rick Miner, the Leon County Commissioner for District 3 and from Tallahassee. We have Mick Piggott, the Associate Dean of Workforce Development and Continuing Education from Manchester Community College. And Rebecca Wallace, uh, the assi Assistant Superintendent of Secondary Education from the Washington Office of Public Instruction. All right. So, so what were the challenges that led each of these states to undertake the work they're here to discuss today? Like in the last decade, right, the need for cloud computing has only just gotten stronger, especially with the pandemic. More and more workloads are onloading into the cloud. And so we, it's the, one of the most important paradigm shifts we've seen from financial services to healthcare to government, right? There are cloud talent gaps across large swaths of employment right now. And so one of the things that we have to do is to grow the cloud talent pipeline to get more students from different areas into these talent pipelines so that we can actually fill this job demand and create you know, great jobs for students, but also so that um, our companies and industry can continue to grow, right? They can't meet their profit targets, they can't expand, they can't offer new products, they can't do any of those things if they can't get tech talent in that can help them expand their work to the cloud, right? So these, this challenge is called a skills gap, right? And so one of the things our team works on is how to identify and address the skills gap and it really takes a cross collaboration, right? It's not something that can be done in isolation. It takes a huge effort between AWS education, industry, academia, government, right? It really is a collaborative effort. So I'm excited that we have these leaders here today to talk about the collaboration that they've had in their states so that we can really show you the impact you can make if you work in entry level talent and really you can empower learners, but also you can empower business and industry and getting folks in these talent pipelines is going to be the way to continue to grow and see success in your organizations. And there were, you know what, I'm so sorry, I stepped in front, I didn't know there were your pictures, so there's your pictures on the slide just in case we need them. Sorry, folks. <laughs> Right. So if we look at the cloud skills gap, right, in November of 2021, 76% of IT decision makers reported uh, IT skills gaps, uh, which is a 145% increase since 2016. Right, 54% of IT decision makers were unable to fill at least one position, and 38% had three or more unfilled roles. So that just gives you an illustration of the demand and one of the reasons we're having this conversation today. So we're creating a more inclusive industry that prepares learners. I might need to be on slide. Hang on real quick. Let me get the slides set up really quick. Sorry, folks. Going back. So let's join. All right, so let's dive into how these learners are these, these states and associations, right, um, really got into addressing this talent gap. So let's start with, um, for now, let's start with you and let's talk about how the state of Connecticut, how did we decide to get involved with AWS in the cloud, Niall? Yeah, so I think it all started when Governor Lamont was elected in 2019. We created what's called the Governor's Workforce Council, which was a, uh, re, a state workforce board in Connecticut comprised of uh, 51 industry leaders, and they spanned all industries from healthcare to technology to construction, et cetera. And we had a series of panels with them. We developed a strategic plan, the first ever in Connecticut around workforce development. And it was really driven by listening to the employers and what their skills needs were in the moment and in the future. Um, so we had a group of panels in the tech industry represented by some of the largest tech employers in the state of Connecticut, ranging from Infosys to Tata Consulting Services, et cetera. And um, they identified a series of occupations and skills that we really um, listened to and worked with our educational partners to develop 
uh, new programs. And I think one of the focus areas of the administration thus far has really been around employment. And right now we've really focused on uh, these shorter term uh, credential based programs, these six to 12 week programs that get people back into work with a new certificate, a new credential um, as quickly as possible. Uh, you know, a few, a few uh, almost a year into the administration, we were struck with a pandemic where we had record high unemployment. So we needed a vessel that was really focused on getting these people back into work as quickly as possible in careers that were not, you know, retail or other other industries that we knew were kind of struck hard by the pandemic. So we really listened to industry, worked with our educational partners, and I think government was in this unique position where we were at the center and we were able to play this convening role where we basically brought industry and education down at the same table. Um, it was a series of long discussions. It took about a year to develop this kind of strategic plan, but um, that sort of collaboration on the front end, um, forced collaboration in some cases, uh, actually led to a, a several new programs now being developed uh, across our whole community college system that are focused on AWS. Um, and we now have students enrolled in those programs. Uh, and I, I'll let my, my colleague over here speak more to that. But um, it really was an exciting venture. And I think uh, it really started with getting industry and education together at the same table to make sure that there was alignment on programming for, for future needs. Yeah, I really like how you talked about there that it started with listening to industry and figuring out the skills that industry needed and sort of working backwards from that. I really enjoyed that because I think that is so important. So Rick, tell us then in Tallahassee in Leon County, how did you get started there? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks Jason. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Uh, well, in, in Tallahassee and Leon County, it's, it's the capital region for the state of Florida, the third largest state in the union. And our IT se tech sector are, are, is, is growing fast. Um, uh, and many of, many of us are convinced we'll be a regional tech hub in the next few years. Um, but competition for talent is, is very high. Um, our monthly IT job postings, for example, are 70% higher than the national average for uh, communities similar to ours. Um, just last week, I was talking to a, an IT business owner who told me, you know, the need for cloud computing is, is so great, and, and I need them in my business. If I were to somehow find people with cloud computing skills, I would hire them like that. I would increase my staff by 10% immediately. Um, so recognizing that need, our, our Office of Economic Vitality, working in conjunction with AWS, um, coordinated with our, our educational institutions and our uh, IT sector to organize a, a round table. And this is about 40 different leaders from around the community of all those different areas, education ed institutions, uh, small business, and our workforce development partners. And for me, in my opinion, that was a breakthrough because we've got robust communication channels already in, in our community, but with cloud computing growing so fast, our businesses were having to just forge ahead just to try to make, make it work. And I, I think that communication with regard specifically to cloud computing was a little, a little outdated. And so that round table that we had just this last February was really the, the catalyst for us to start having our educational institutions work with cloud computing and AWS uh, certifications to try to roll this out to, to try to accommodate that need. Yeah, and I love the fact that bringing the businesses together really got them to sort of realize the need in your local community. And it might have been a, a need that was larger than I think they maybe even realized at that moment in time. So I think that was great to work backwards from the need and then the skills gap. That's very true. Tallahassee and Leon County, we're a very cohesive community. I, I believe that our different, uh, our, our sectors communicate pretty well. But with regard to cloud computing, which has been growing so quickly, I, I think we needed to have that round table to have people understand exactly how big the need was within our private sector sector and then have our educational institutions pick up and, and fill that gap. Yeah, thank you. And so Becky, in Washington State, things are interesting there because you have a first of its kind agreement with AWS to certify 2,500 high school students, right, by 2004. So how did that get started? And, and tell us about this first of its kind agreement and the opportunity it's going to offer students in Washington State. Sure. Thanks, Jason. Um, so AWS actually met with uh, us in Washington first to elevate kind of what education needed. So they did a listening tour um, and it had nothing to do with this partnership. It had to do with a pandemic response. So our schools were shut down. They'd been shut down uh, over a long period of time. And Washington is, is a hub for technology, but there's definitely communities that didn't have access to that technology. So through that partnership that was built through this listening tour across the state, really elevating the voice of educators, uh, we came to a, a communication about this credential pathway. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, at that time, what they were giving to us was free curriculum, which are there educators in the room? 
Any educators in the room, freeze our favorite, thank you, one, freeze our favorite price, right, for any curriculum. Uh, however, the credential that would allow for either preferred employment or preferred interview really wasn't obtainable until students were in college. Uh, and so we had this conversation um, that was very direct, that we appreciated the free curriculum, um, but what we want for students in Washington is the opportunity to demonstrate their skills and competencies earlier so that they have access to either decide that they need additional education and training, uh, or they can go direct to employment. And so we really pushed uh, and in partnership looked at trying something new. Luckily, the AWS team came back and was willing to give us a try. Um, we've made really significant statewide investments in computer science in general, uh, making sure that every student has access to computer science and in high school that it counts for math and science graduation credit requirements. And we just believed that if we had students have the opportunity that they would rise to the occasion. Um, so through our partnership and through our communication uh, of just saying, hey, let, let us roll the dice and let us see what our students can do. They've had access to technology earlier. Um, they have interests and skills and abilities that will match and allow them to earn these credentials. Uh, let's see if this pilot works. So we were able to sign the first of, of any agreement in the world, um, bringing that curriculum earlier into this education pipeline. Uh, but we did that in partnership with our, our partners at community and technical colleges. In our state, we have 34. Um, that's who is already offering the education and training opportunities to individuals in Washington State. Uh, and then we met with our workforce board as well. And our workforce board obviously is um, central to understanding our economic need and our education and training need. Uh, they represent government, labor, and business equally. And so when we're trying to launch uh, any type of programming that allows for students and young employees to go direct into the workforce, we want to make sure that we're also aware of the labor impact so we're not displacing adult workers. Um, so that was part of what we did. I'm happy to talk about it um, more in the future. but. But we're really excited, and we're really at infancy, right? So we we've, we've um, haven't had our first group of students earn credentials yet, uh, but we've had our, our schools sign on and are excited about that opportunity for students. Yeah, and you know, sometimes it does take a little bit of time to build up, but there's a theme that I'm hearing in everything that everyone has said so far, and that really is like cross-collaboration. And if you notice, all of them started with listening. They started listening to educators, to employers, to industry, to needs in the community and different organizations. And that listening allows that the cross-collaboration and allows us to start thinking about how we can address the mismatch between jobs and the skills that are needed by employers today. So Mick, um, tell us, what you're, how are you seeing leaders come together to act in concept across Connecticut? Uh, thanks, Jason. Hi, everyone. Um, so I, I really believe that the cross-sector collaboration in our state has been phenomenal um, up until this point. Um, you know, anywhere from the from the governor to the office of the uh, workforce strategy, where, where Neil is a part of, um, all the way down to the college uh, program coordinators, everyone sort of working together to make this program a success. Um, so I'll answer your question by just sort of giving you an abbreviated timeline of what we've been doing so far. Uh, so from my perspective, it started um, shortly after sh shortly after uh, the partnership between. AWS and the community college system um, was finalized. Uh, a press conference was uh, put together by the governor, uh, by the president of the community college system and university systems, um, and, and some other dignitaries to really talk about the advantages and the opportunities associated with cloud, with cloud computing. Um, so, and they, they also touted you know, how the colleges uh, could create opportunities uh, for students to get into the field. Um, so shortly after that, the colleges basically pulled together employers, workforce development partners, um, and other academic uh, partners um, into, into one room to really sort of assess the AWS curriculum, make sure that it's meeting the needs of our workforce. Um, obviously that conversation went well, because I'm here today. Um, and then shortly after that, we did a, a soft launch. So two of the 12 community colleges in Connecticut uh, started offering the AWS Foundations course um, in, in a variety of modalities. We did uh, a few on ground and a few online. Um, those were successful. Um, and the, the plan is, since then is to ramp up uh, our offerings um, uh, to, to go out to the rest of the community colleges in our state. Uh, the goal right now is to have all 12 basically offering some version of AWS um, by, the, by this fall. Um, in addition to that, um, some of our employer partners, the, the leadership in the, in the employers, um, are really sort of upping the ante in, sort of in terms of the collaboration. 
uh, Infosys, which Jason uh, uh, mentioned before, um, they're actually guaranteeing interviews for our students who go through our courses. Um, that's huge in the marketing side, um, and it's also uh, you know huge in terms of the value add to, to our course as well too. So they're really stepping up on that side, and it really shows how much they're um, uh, valuing this relationship that we have. And then finally, uh, our AWS uh, team, our AWS partners, um, are, are actively uh, working to connect us with uh, companies, uh, local companies in our area, uh, that will add to this collaborative um, effort. And um, you know, so far it's going really great working with Kolu over here, and it's it's been fantastic. Um, so just to sort of summarize, uh, you know, we, there's great collaborative efforts between uh, state leadership, uh, business leadership. Um, and academics um, as well to make this a success and to build that talent pipeline. And I love that you mentioned that you know you have employers that are guaranteeing interviews to some of the graduates from this program. And I think that that's why this cross collaboration is so important, right? Because if we don't get the skill set right from the beginning in the programs that we're offering, it's not possible to make those guaranteed connections for students. But I think having those guaranteed connections to employment allows students to really make the training real while they're in it and connect what they're doing now to a potential career path in the future. So um, you know. Now, what are the risks, right, in not fostering cross-collaboration like this? Yeah, um, you know, I think we're in a really unique labor market right now where we're seeing there's actually more open jobs than workers looking for jobs. I think this is sort of an unprecedented time um, when thinking about what reskilling actually means. Um, I mentioned in my previous comments, and all my colleagues here have alluded to it, I mean, this rapid reskilling is just really critical right now. These um, six to 12 week programs that can get someone back into work with you know, as minimal as a high school diploma, um, but now they have an industry recognized credential um, that's validated by employers. Um, it's really critical to addressing some of this rapid employment shifts that we're seeing. Um, I think the AWS certificate's a perfect example of one that is uh, you know, not long, it's not intensive, but it really is recognized by industry. That's kind of the critical piece, there's a lot of certificates out there that I think people get, uh, that are advertised that are not necessarily something that's gonna land you a job. Um, but when you have something like the AWS certificate, that's really, really critical. Um, I would mention like just two main risks. One is there's a fundamental gap between what employers are looking to hire for and what uh, uh, educational partners are offering. Um, that's been a long time gap in Connecticut, and I think since uh, the governor's election, we've been really prioritizing this sort of cross-collaboration between education and business to make sure that these programs are developed. And if, that's, if that bridge is not uh, made, then you have the risk of brain drain. You know, Connecticut uh, is in a unique position where we have one of the highest per capita rates for colleges in the country, but um, that we, people were flocking to Boston, people were flocking to New York, uh, we were losing students who were graduating institutions, but now we have this opportunity with, with AWS, with, with other collaborators to really make sure that those folks stay in state because they have the opportunity to earn something very quickly that's inexpensive, that also has a high return on investment when they're making forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year uh, based on only 18 weeks or 12 weeks of an education. Um, so I think you know, that, that coupled with um, you know, the real focus and intentionality of addressing this brain drain issue um, is, is really fundamental for kind of assessing what the risks are up front when evaluating these types of programs. Thank you, Nal. And you know, and I like the fact that we have panelists from sort of different points along the spectrum as far as how long they've been working on this. And so in, in Tallahassee, Leon County, where Rick is from, we had the round table very recently and I, was, I got to participate in that and it was a great round table. But Rick, tell us, how have things evolved since that round table? Yeah, for sure. I, I'll tell you. And what, let me real quick and, uh, uh, springboard off of something that, that Niall just said. You know, <clears throat> Leon County is a great place to live. Uh, we actually are the most educated county in the state of Florida if you measure it by per capita degrees. But we also have high poverty. Our poverty is about seven points higher than the state average. So anything that we can do to help develop our workforce and raise incomes from people that are unemployed, underemployed, um, with, with you know, cloud computing skill development is particularly very um, exciting for us. So since February, in the last three months, uh, we've had um, three new educational institutions become members of the AWS Academy. Two others are looking at it. 
Um, we've also had our entrepreneurial laboratory, Domi Station, start working with AWS on opportunities where our startup businesses can incorporate cloud computing in some of the work that they're doing. Um, we've also got the Leon County School District, which is also talking about uh, bringing on AWS Academy as well as AWS Educate. Um, and uh, it's, just, it, it's incredible to see all this work taking place since that February roundtable, three short months and to, uh, to, to see this opportunity for helping to develop skills in our workforce and help raise incomes um, as, a, as a county commissioner, as an elected official that uh, talks to folks in our, in our workforce every day, to see that happening and start to uh, calcify uh, a real program to um, meet the need is, is really encouraging for us. Yeah, thank you, Rick. So, I mean, I love that, right, this group represents such a, a grounded mission to empower the future workforce. And it's just really great that they've all been bought into this work, they've vested in it, and really illustrates, though, like as, as Rick said, it's not just government and industries, like in Leon County, it's Domi Station, it is are their business groups and associations. It really is a community-wide effort in a lot of these places. And, and that is really what it takes. It's like the whole village kind of coming together to solve this cloud skills gap. Right. So, Becky, tell us more about the programs that you're leading in Washington, uh, some of the core components that you believe are essential to training and certifying these 2,500 students. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, I lead Secondary Education and Pathway Preparation at OSPI. We're led by Superintendent Chris Rakedahl, who has a unique background in that he is a statistician, <laughs> an economist uh, statistician, and also worked in the Community and Technical College system uh, before he was elected to lead K-12. So, he's been very vocal. Um, from election to election about the importance of transforming our K-12 educational system so that um, folks like Niall don't say there's a gap between education and training and employment. Uh, so we want to close that gap as early as possible and that takes increasing access and then also support for preparation programs. So part of the work that I lead is ensuring that our secondary systems, specifically middle and high schools, um, are really transformed into systems that are about student need and student interest. So curriculum that is driven and by uh, the learner itself. And so when we look at the, the graduation policy that has been passed in our state, it's acknowledging that there's multiple pathways to success and that our job and responsibility in K-12 is to make sure that we increase access and ability for students to demonstrate that competency irrespective of what pathway they choose. So whether they're going to, going to continue to a two-year or four-year system, uh, whether they're going to pursue an apprenticeship or they're gonna go direct to employment of the military, uh, it, our responsibility is to make sure that they're not only aware of those pathways and that there's multiple ways to get to end goals when it comes to career, uh, but that they are, should be building transfer skills and and for students that means they have to be able to articulate what those skills are um, because that's what the employer needs so uh, my background is in career and technical education so we have a, a very firm foundation and working with the businesses and communities to really drive what's taught in, in schools, um, but we also understand that our students are going to be mobile and they're going to move, and, and we think Washington's the best place to earn and learn and live, um, but we want our students to be successful irrespective of where they choose to go. So some of what we have been doing uh, in Washington is making sure that our curriculum, and especially our graduation pathway specific to CTE, um, has access to dual credit or an industry recognized credential, and we're not alone. Every state is figuring out that uh, credentials of value don't have to just be the, the traditional degrees. Degrees are important and there's always going to be space for that. Uh, but being able to have a credential opportunity for students while they're still in the K-12 system or that they can complete shortly thereafter opens up employment opportunities. And, and our economy tells us that young people need to work because <laughs> they can get a million degrees and not have a single skill that they can articulate to an employer. Um, so that is what we continue to work on. And, and in terms of the components that will either make this successful or make it a pilot that I'll have egg on my face for, for smack, smack talk in AWS to get, it, get us there, um, I think number one, the regular communication with the AWS team has been critical. Um, number one, because we get to say what we're hearing from educators and they get to give us feedback from industry. Uh, and those have to be equally valued voices for something to implement and work. Um, and lifting up student voice, I think, is critical. We're excited to have students give feedback to the curriculum and also the credential. Um, certainly professional learning for educators. What I really like about this specific pilot and, and this Amazon um, program is that 
our teachers have to pass the credential first. And I think that's critical when you're looking at really being a good educator is being able to demonstrate your own competency because high school students, they sniff fear and also competency themselves. So uh, we're excited about that part. Um, our pilot specifically gives the teacher credential for free. Uh, which is great, that lowers barriers for implementation as our communities and our educational systems are still recovering from impacts from the pandemic. And then the credentials for students are cut in half in terms of cost and our state is working on covering the other costs so that our students have access to their credentials for free. So communication, um, professional development, professional lear learning, and then marketing not being a dirty word. It's not a dirty word. If we call it education or communication, then people, it tends to land with them differently. Uh, but this will not be successful if students and parents don't understand really what what the program is and what it means if a student earns one of these credentials, what are the opportunities. Um, and short-term credential programs sometimes uh, take a hit because it's like you're either elevating the short-term credential and then downplaying uh, continuing education. And so we're really intentional that we wanna be able to articulate if a student earns one of these credentials, there are additional credentials, there are additional degrees, there's always additional um, learning that can be done that'll help expand their employment opportunities. Uh, and, and, and close with probably the biggest piece for us to really feel comfortable about a pilot is that we're not supporting a credential that only is, is recognized by a singular employer. And so that's why we're really excited about these because cloud computing skills are gonna be needed. Uh, every data point reflects that multiple employers are saying we needed it 10 years ago, we need it now. Um, and so we're, we're thankful that we have this opportunity to scale in Washington. Wow, but there's a lot of good stuff in, in what you just talked about. Um, but one of the things that really stood out to me and that I really liked was that you mentioned, you know, that looking outside the traditional degree, that there are opportunities to start on the workforce development side and with career certificates and certifications and credentials. So that makes me think about Mick and Connecticut and some of the work that, that they did, Mick. Because in, you know, your program, your partnership with AWS was announced by your governor in 2001, right? I'm not, sorry, 2021, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> right, and, and that's not that long ago, but there's been a lot of good stuff. So tell us about your process. What process did you use to get started? And, and maybe why did you go the workforce development route? Sure. Um, first of all, I think Connecticut's a better place to, to work and learn. Just, just want to test it out. <laughs> um, so uh, immediately after the uh, announcement was made uh, with the AWS uh, Community College uh, Partnership, um, uh, We've started thinking about how to how to roll something out and develop something, and um, the the rollout is ongoing right now for both the credit and the non-credit side. Um, on the non-credit side, we immediately met with our workforce uh, development board, um, sort of figured out um, uh, what are the most popular career paths um, right now for people looking to get into the IT field um, that would also incorporate the AWS curriculum. Um, through those conversations, we determined, uh, we, we came up with four, um, IT support, uh, web developer, um, uh, IT security, and network maintenance and design. Um, so with that information, uh, we then started sort of, you know, dipping into uh, our catalog of courses uh, to come up with uh, a program and that basically became an IT track uh, for each of those career paths. Uh, so for example, like IT support on one spectrum is gonna include um, not only the AWS Foundations course, uh, we'll have a plus MS Office certification courses, uh, maybe some Network Plus, um, you know, and so forth. So well, basically courses that will qualify someone to be um, an entry level um, employee in, in the IT support field. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, with the network maintenance, uh, we included um, a lot of the higher level AWS uh, curriculum. Uh, so that would include obviously the, the AWS architect and AWS developer and so on and so forth. Um, so we, we developed those courses um, as IT tracks um, and uh, you know, we're, we're rolling that out and uh, we should uh, have uh, those tracks basically ready to go by, by the fall um, and, and that's sort of what we put together. Um, on the credit side, it moves a little bit slower than, than, than non-credit for, for obvious reasons with accreditation and getting uh, curriculum aligned. But they are working um, feverishly to um, develop and enhance uh, programs that incorporate the AWS curriculum, um, which obviously has some significant advantages for students because now they can apply financial aid to the cost of the course. So uh, we're really looking forward to that, um, and that's something that's ongoing right now. 
Yeah, and I love the fact that you illustrated that there's a timeline thing. In the academia world, we have to go through accreditation, right? Sometimes there's a process, mm -hmm. but it's still possible to start on that non-credit workforce development side and get students into this pathway in, in a quicker approach, but still have that credit sort of articulate in to the four credit program once it's off the ground and going. And those kinds of things are important, but, but all of those kinds of things take leadership, and sometimes they take dollars, right, as well, and, and funding perspectives. So now tell us a little bit about how does a state decide to fund something like this and, and to invest in a program? Yeah, um, you know, I would say there's, there's multiple factors, but w one of the primary ones is we, we really try to focus on um, what populations are we trying to serve. And I think uh, from an economic standpoint, we looked at two primary factors, and one was unemployed workers and underemployed workers. If we're looking at return on investment for where our dollar can make the biggest bang for taxpayer, taxpayer revenue. Um, people who don't have a job who could in 16 weeks be earning $50,000, um, that's a no-brainer for us. And um, you know, Mick mentioned uh, the regional workforce development boards. They're a critical partner in this because we need to find recruitment channels for these programs that are based in the community and that can actually have clear ties to individuals who are historically un underrepresented in tech, um, who have faced higher unemployment in regional areas in the state. Um, so we were really intentional about what geographic areas, what uh, socio socioeconomic areas we targeted um, from an unemployed perspective. There's also the underemployed, and I think this is probably more critical because there's more of them nominally in the state, um, but this was really focused on the reskilling pathway rather than the upskilling pathway. So we looked at um, individuals who were not really happy in their current role, again, whether it was uh, healthcare, whether it was retail, whether it was uh, hospitality, and we said, you know, check out this new certificate program. You can get a credential in 12 weeks, you could be earning, uh, you know, 60% more income. Um, and so we have uh, invested. Uh, it, from the last legislative session, $110 million uh, in federal uh, American Rescue Plan funds uh, to help kickstart the rollout of uh, these non-credit uh, industry-recognized credential programs that are almost entirely focused on these unemployed, underemployed uh, workers across the state. Um, so that's one sort of vessel. The second vessel, I think, is understanding the regional economic impacts. And one of the main ways that we've done that in Connecticut is formed these regional sector partnerships. Um, we've done this across uh, four different industries. There's 10 of them right now in Connecticut. And these are highly or hyper local groups of employers that come down, come together to a table and say, what are our priorities as an industry within you know, Southwest Connecticut in or around Stanford? Um, we have two tech partnerships in Connecticut right now, one based in Stanford, Connecticut, one based in Hartford, Connecticut. And um, the, the whole model is start with employers, get a group of 20 to 30 employers around the table, understand what their priorities are from a hiring perspective, what are their priorities from a labor market perspective, and then engage additional partners, whether it's educators, whether it's community-based organizations, uh, whether it's municipal governments, uh, to help kind of supplement and bring in investments to develop programs that are aligned with these employer needs. So this sort of um, hyper-regional effort was the exact uh, uh, input that led to AWS being identified as a core skill that Connecticut employers are looking for. We sat down uh, 25 employers in the Hartford region, um, almost overwhelmingly all of whom said AWS, AWS, AWS. Um, and at that point, it was a no-brainer for the administration. We had these American Rescue Plan dollars. We're rolling out uh, our job training program right now called Career Connect, which I can talk more about later. But um, it was sort of uh, you know, a clear s s indication from these employers that that investment was really um, uh, needed and would benefit the state long-term by increasing the incomes of these individuals who were either currently unemployed or underemployed in this case. Uh, thanks. Now, and there's, there's a lot of good stuff in, in what all of you have said, but one of the common themes in this is, is serving sort of the underserved and unemployed and sort of getting people into the workforce fast so that they can really address this need, but also so that they can increase their own economy and start gaining real dollars and lift themselves out of poverty. So some of you in the audience might be wanting to learn more about how to connect with graduates from these programs, and you can scan the QR code and learn about AWS programs and connect with graduates. But I'd like to, to segue into a, 
a different conversation right now and talk about because we've talked about underserved and un unemployed and under underemployed and underserved, but there's also a diversity aspect to this, right? Um, so there's a few angles on this, but it's much as much about equality as it is about enabling innovation, right? Because 68% of the American public lacks a bachelor's degree, and that includes 78% for black Americans and 85% for Hispanic Americans. The impact here is that potential employees are being shut out of opportunities um, and companies are cutting themselves off from potential talent pools by not looking outside of that traditional degree and then looking for more diverse talent pipelines, right? So Becky, what advice do you have for others in the K-12 space that are wanting to help develop the next generation of diverse cloud-ready talent? Yeah, that's a really big question uh, because of, of everybody in the room, um, you have different representation, but if your company has had a new DEI effort in the last two years, would you raise your hand? Probably. I expect more, to be honest. Um, so I don't know a single employment sector that hasn't recognized that their workforce doesn't entirely represent the customers that they serve. Um, I would say the last, in the last month alone, if we set IT aside, there's uh, multiple different industry representatives that come and meet with our, um, our state agency and say, hey, we want to develop this program or we want to recruit students because there's large, large retirements and then there's also a large gap in, um, in the diversity of their employees. And so I think it starts with having increased access for students, um, but the hard piece is that it has to start with student voice because sometimes we have knee-jerk policy reactions where we think as long as we require something to take place in a school setting, suddenly that will magically mean uh, that people have the support that they need and that access will solve it all, and it doesn't. So I really appreciate Niall's conversation about the way that investments are made. They have to be intentional, um, and we've had a lot of federal dollars flow in the last you know, two years um, with intentionality, but if we just assumed that every single student would be best served by adopting every single program, we would have uh, a lot of pilots in Washington, and we probably wouldn't have anything come to fruition. We also have Career Connect Washington, so, you know, <laughs> not that we're in competition or anything, but the point is that every single state constantly has an education problem, they constantly have a workforce problem, and, and by problem I mean their priorities, right? So when we look at investments into the educational system to make sure that we have more diverse uh, workers, it's making sure that the programs that are offered in communities represent the communities, and that we're elevating community voice to figure out what is needed, because not every single community needs the same uh, needs the same type of program, right? So when we roll out this specific AWS, like we're gonna be very intentional in looking at where are the students, which students are accessing the credentials right away and which are not. And then how do we fund to make sure that if there's a gap in that, that we offset that uh, because there is a notion that um, IT and computing is, is reserved for, you have to have this specific set of skills. And a lot of what happens is that students don't have exposure to the types of work that they may want to, to pursue. And so part of what we've been really thankful for is that AWS has been uh, very open to, to having people that work for them uh, and folks that are employed communicate in the schools. And we wanna make sure that individuals that are going to schools uh, can speak positively about opportunities for all students. And if we see that there's gaps in implementation, then that's our job as the two systems together to make sure that we understand why there's a gap and then try to communicate to close that gap. Um, our, we need to use data to do that. Um, we're lucky at the agency that I work in to have a lot of, lot of data. We know who's enrolled, we know by demographic who's enrolled, we know where there's access, where programs are offered, where they're not. Um, and that's really critical to have direct conversations when the way we implement something or the way it's communicating will not work for every community. Um, we have a, a very large uh, native education role in our state and the way that you do government to government work with tribes is entirely different. So if we just rolled out and said, hey, great news guys, here you go. Um, it wouldn't work well. We have to listen to the communities and then determine what the gaps are and, and work to close those gaps. Um, but it starts with access, so supporting all students' access if that's what they know that they want, and then doing the work to make sure that they understand what it even means for cloud computing. What does it mean to have a, a credential? What doors are open for them? 
You know, there's so many great things in, in what you just said, but one of the things I really took away from that is that students need to be able to imagine themselves in this career because so many times if they're not exposed to it early on and they can't picture themselves in the role, they don't even think that's a pathway for them. Absolutely. So I'm so excited and it, and it really does, I think, begin with listening and listening to students as, as part of that equation. I'm so happy that you said that. So Niall, tell us a little bit from the Connecticut perspective, how are you ensuring that you know, a diverse talent pool is developed in your state? Yeah, um, a sticky question, but a good one. Um, I would say three, three kind of main things we've been working on. Um, one is what we're calling kind of skills-based hiring initiatives. Um, this is where we're actually working with employers to redesign job descriptions to make them not require a four-year degree for tech, but rather actually just require a short-term credential or a skill. Um, we view this as a win-win. It's a win because the talent pool is broadened for employers to choose from, and the access points are now broadened for individuals to enter these careers where they don't need an expensive four-year degree to do so. Um, so what, uh, with our, these regional sector partnerships that I had mentioned before, we had convened a group of roughly 12 tech employers in the Hartford area. Um, all of whom had indicated that they're really willing to broaden their job specifications um, and their recruiting practices to be more focused on skills. Um, and we're in the midst of actually uh, uh, rolling out in, uh, a pilot in, the, in our Hartford area on tech around this sort of skills-based hiring um, concept, but it's challenging. I mean, these are deeply rooted hiring practices by employers and it takes several really intentional workshops, design sessions, um, to better understand how we can rewrite their job descriptions, redesign their HR hiring practices um, to make sure that it's focused on skills and not degrees. Um, the second is uh, we've developed a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee on our Governor's Workforce Council, which is again our state, our state workforce uh, development board. Um, we have a number of committees, but this is our newest one, and it basically com is comprised of working groups that are focused on specific demographics and specific populations who have been historically underrepresented in Connecticut. So we have uh, a BIPOC committee, we have a veterans committee, we have a people with disabilities committee, we have a youth committee, and we have a reentry committee. So these are very hyper-focused working groups that um, we determined need to tell us how to best serve their constituents, because I think Oftentimes, a lot of people can say top down from the government, this is what needs to happen, but we're trying to take more of a bottoms up approach. And for, within each of these working groups, they're comprised of community-based organizations who are, again, hyper-local um, and can really tell us what their needs are from a programming perspective, from an access point perspective, um, from a supportive services perspective. A lot of times, um, a limiting factor for individuals in accessing these types of programs is childcare, is transportation, um, where that really prevents them from even completing the program in the first place, let alone actually maintaining their employment. So um, this, this new committee is really fundamental to our sort of equity strategy as, a, as an administration. Um, the last is uh, Connecticut's Career Connect, um, but you know, we, we rolled out our, our, our new uh, program uh, earlier this year. It was a $70 million investment in short-term job training programs. Um, and every person that is served with this program has to be from an underrepresented or historically marginalized community. That is a non-starter for us in terms of the recruitment practices. Um, so we really focus on two sort of primary recruitment channels for these programs. One, like I mentioned before, the regional workforce development boards who uh, operate their American Job Center system that are, again are, are very deeply rooted in the communities. Um, as well as community-based organizations. I think that was sort of an untapped uh, recruiting arm in the state that really has um, access points to individuals, whether it's a faith-based community, uh, whether it's a, a really low uh, or high poverty uh, area in an urban center, um, you know, what, what have you, they're really um, able to tap those communities and say, here are opportunities that you can envision yourself in, as what we were talking about before, because I think that um, representation um, and idealization is really key when promoting these types of careers because I think um, not correctly a lot of these people think they can't work in these careers but it's absolutely a viable career path for them they just need to get that sort of exposure from from the ground up so 
just three three kind of uh, key initiatives that we're working on in this space. Yeah, and I completely agree with that. They need to be able to imagine themselves in the role. So really quick, Mick, I've got one final question. I'm going to give it to you because I think there might be folks in the, in the audience that want to know the answer to this, and that is if they want to get started working on a process, because you've dove really deep in this in Connecticut and you've had your hands in the curriculum and all the various parts. So if somebody wants to start this process in their state and in one of their colleges, where should they start? Hmm. Um, so I, I think... You, uh, the first thing you should do is figure out whether or not you have the capacity and capability to offer the, these courses. That would be where I would start. So you know, you'd be working with your your business office, your legal, um, you know, certain contacts, uh, internal contacts, to make sure that you've got the capacity to really make sure that this is going to be successful down the line. Uh, secondly, uh, and this is a big one, is uh, try to get buy-in from leadership as early as possible. Um, you know, for us, um, you know, I'd mentioned before, it, it was a press conference that the governor and, and the president of our community college and university system um, held um, that really kind of got the ball rolling, at least from my perspective. Um, so getting the buy-in and um, getting participation from leadership very early on is, is key. Um, not only uh, leadership from like the governor and so, and so on and so forth, but uh, business leadership, workforce development leadership, um, really start setting the stage and, and, uh, and meeting with these individuals uh, and, and getting their, their input um, and making sure that uh, they're on board is key. And then the final thing, and this probably should have been the first, is reach out to the AWS team. Um, I can definitely tell you from, from, from experience, you know, working with Rebecca, Kolu, and, 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 all, and everyone else has been, has been fantastic. They're extremely knowledgeable. Um, they're extremely friendly, uh, we get along really well, um, and uh, they're a really, really great resource um, in terms of uh, getting the ball rolling and, and giving you any sort of information that you need. So um, that's my plug for, for them for today. <laughs> Thanks. That, that's a great recap, actually. So many good things there. And I love how you called out the, the press conference because prior to joining AWS, I would not have thought a press conference could be a motivating factor in bringing these collaborations together. But I've seen it now in multiple states, right, that has been the, really the catalyst for so many of these initiatives. So we've got some time now, and we can take some questions. So if there are questions, uh, we're happy to try and answer them. All right, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yep. There's some in the back. Hi, I'm Brenda with the Cloud Guru and Plural Site. And um, I'm just curious, and I think this question can go to all of you. How do you identify maybe where the skill gaps are? And then from a leadership perspective, how are you tracking where those skill gaps are and making sure that you're delivering content and courses that are appropriate for, again, where those skill gaps are. I can take it. Yeah, go ahead, Rick. Well, just really, I'll be really quick because we're running short on time. Um, it, it comes back to that, that strong, robust communication between our, our IT business sector, our educational institutions, and our workforce development partners. Um, and the, the good thing, and I'm sure Connecticut and Washington have the same um, uh, resources, is that we have, we have businesses in Tallahassee that have been working with AWS for years. And they've, they've developed uh, an internal pipeline, really, to develop their talent so that they can have people join their company. Well, they, they have expertise in cloud computing skill development because they've worked with AWS for years on it. And so we listen to them uh, very intently to make sure that you know, they're speaking to us about, they know, the, they know our community. They also know what it's like to develop cloud computing skills uh, with, for their company. So listening to them and then having our educational institution partners work with them to make sure that those skills are being met in those specific areas is really key for us. In Tallahassee, you know, one of our biggest, our, our small businesses, our IT businesses, one of their biggest clients is the state. You know, they work with state agencies, and so and they work with those agencies for years. They know where those cloud computing um, uh, efforts are going in terms of porting, you know, the old systems to the new. And we listen very, very closely to them on making sure that we can fill those specific skills gaps. Yeah, I would just yeah. add that um, the, the 
programs that are adopted in, in local schools, uh, specifically those that are career and technical education programs, they have to have advisory committee representation uh, and they have to represent the actual programs that are offered. And so that relationship with the business representatives on the advisory committee with the educators is the most fluid way to be able to have that communication of where, where is there a gap and what students are exiting the program with and then having the education system be adaptable. Uh, and for Washington, for there to be a program that's offered, there has to be economic um, data to back that it's necessary. And so we look at both the skills that our individuals are exiting programs with, the gaps that we hear from the community and technical college program, and then ultimately our employers as well. And then internally at AWS, we hear this conversation from multiple states and we collate that data. And when partners start working with us, we're happy to share the data that we have so that we can really start to identify where those gaps are. So we have time for one more question. Hi, um, my name is Yun Kwan. I, my affiliation's um, University of Pennsylvania. I work in academia, so that's why I came to this session. Um, my question is for the policymakers. Um, you know, with, with IT and engineering, it's really the rubber meets the road is when you're actually doing the job. You know, it's learning by doing. Um, how, how are you making sure that students get practical skills in doing things in addition to certifications? Thank you. Yeah, I can try, that's a good question. I, I would say for the programs that we roll out, um, we try to do a mix of three different types of skill sets. Uh, so one is the technical skills, um, giving them you know lab time in front of a computer, in this case, um, coupled with professional skills. Uh, I think a lot of the, when we're targeting individuals who are long-term unemployed, underemployed, these are folks that have sometimes been out of the workplace for over a year. Um, and need sort of refinement on their professional and employability skills. But the last piece is we try to couple um, this technical skill component with a six month internship. Um, and that's really kind of a critical component of the programs where we try to get investment from the business. If not, we'll subsidize the student's wage. Um, but that on the job experience is beyond critical when we're trying to incentivize uh, enrollment in these programs, especially from uh, a student standpoint. These students don't want to just be stuck in front of a laptop coding all day. They want to be actually at, in an office working with people doing that. Um, so that sort of six month internship is a really key component of the programs we roll out. Very good. Rick, did you have a follow up? Yeah, just a quick thing. You know, I, Washington and Connecticut are great places to live and work. <laughs> uh, but if you want to be part of an emerging regional tech hub, come join us in Leon County. We'd love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love the competition because it really is all about helping students get connected with great cloud careers, which is something I'm super passionate about. So thank you. If you have questions that we couldn't answer today, reach out to someone on the education team at AWS. We'd be happy to try and answer them for you later. Thank you so much. Thank you.